what we're doing is we're going to be going to accessibility in the user. To understand how to truly design accessible environments, we need to understand the users that we're designing them for and how they interact with materials. This is rather in the classroom or online, either way. And this specifically deals with this group of individuals. And we're going to start, first of all, with visual disabilities. But first I want to ask, anybody in here have a disability? Anyone else? I mean, you know, I, I know I'm asking you to identify yourself. But. As I get older, I'm having a lot more disabilities. My eyes are more different. Right. I'm having a hard time seeing that. My leg hurts, you know. Well, unlike my partner who will tell you that you're a liar, I'll just say, if you're wearing these and these are what make or allows you to function, you have a disability. You have a disabling condition. If you cannot function without your glasses, this is an assistive technology. This is one version of it. Now, see how insidious this is? We aren't thinking of ourselves as having disabilities. We just need glasses. Think about that. I, now, me, I'm legally blind without them. All I get to see is a bunch of blur and colors and shapes, and that's it. I'm just, I'm horrible. But the point being is, this is an assistive technology that then allows me to function. Now, how many of you are that corrective? Go ahead and raise your hand. Yeah. Yeah. It makes all the difference in the world. I mean, I cannot function without these, well, I can with assistive technologies, others. But with them, I'm fine. I don't consider myself a person with a disability. I just wear glasses. Well, the entire culture of persons with disabilities feel the same way. It used to be that they would go ahead and say, OK, sure, I'm a person with a disability. At one point, it's, I'll own that I'm a person with a disability. But now the language has moved to, I have other abilities. Literally, I have other abilities. I'm not a person with a disability. I just get information or I just interact with the environment that I live in differently than you do. That's it. So there's a big, huge cultural shift in this process. So we need to think that no longer is this a disability question, it's just other abilities as we go. So looking at individuals who are <clears throat> blind, this group is very interesting for the accessibility component. They're the one group that actually requires all four principles to be met in design. The rest of the groups do not, but this group does. And specifically, when we're talking about perceivable, it's because this group cannot perceive visual information, graphics, layouts, color-based cues. They usually depend on another type of input source that they're using, for instance, a computer to get access to different types of technology. They cannot understand content that is presented in an illogical fashion. Bad layout. And then, of course, they have assistive technologies to be able to get access to this material or environment. Now, let me ask you this. How do you think this group <laughs> gets access to computers or information. Can you think of any ways? There's an older traditional way, a couple of them. Can you think of any? No? Okay. There was a print alternative at one point in time before technology became what it was in the last 20 years. Anybody know what that is? Braille, right? So that was the tactile stimulation and that was the alternative for print. Now, now we have technology, and there are other means. You can still get access with Braille, too, in the electronic environment. And I'll talk about that later. But specifically, a lot of the individuals that get access to our materials are using screen readers. And what a screen reader is, is literally a tool that takes all that information coming to your computer, and it looks at it, parses through the text and parses through the functionality and then allows that assistive technology to 
then sit in between so the person can use keystrokes to be able to get access to that environment. All right? So, let me ask you this. How many of you in here would like to be able to read 600 words per minute and comprehend what you've read? I'm surprised not all hands are going up because I know I would. That's huge. This group right here, the intermediate JAWS user or screen reader user, very often can read that quickly and comprehend just as well. So they can be in the reading process of material, they can be way out ahead as far as the rest of us are concerned because we're depending on our vision that slows us down. This group, because their body has adjusted and they have used the resistive technology, can then, their different ability allows them to get access to material, specifically text, much faster. Now, it might be more difficult for them to then use that tool, for instance, in the quiz environment in D2L, to actually, they might read the material fast, but they have to function in, within that environment, navigate it, and that slows them down. So you have, okay, I'm reading fast, but it takes me this much longer to do this. And then they might actually require an accommodation, although we have developed this to where they can get access to it independently. They can take their test all on their own, but they need to have time and a half because of how long it takes them to navigate the environment. So this group has differing abilities that in some cases, because of how they're able to use the environment, provides some abilities that are maybe to an advantage to them in dealing with text or not. Low vision. There's lots of different reasons, lots of, lots of different low visions. A lot of us, because we're wearing glasses, have low vision. We can emulate what it's like to have low vision for different reasons. I have all sorts of issues wrong with my eyes. And specifically this group, if you notice, the principle is perceivable. So it's how they perceive the environment. In this case, small text content that doesn't enlarge well or doesn't have sufficient contrast so then they could see it well that is a barrier. Now what's nice about that is if it's enlargeable or should we say scalable environments, both in electronic documents, online, whatever, then there are assistive technologies that will allow them to get access to that material or they might even get access to it or we might get access to it. In order to blow this up so you could better see it, what did I do? I just use a zoom function, right? Okay. That means this material is accessible. It is scalable. It doesn't pixelate when it gets zoomed, magnified. That's sort of a magnification function. So really, that's all you need to do is make sure that you meet those guidelines. Now specifically some of the groups and how they're dealing with this, for instance, macular degeneration. Here's a picture of what it looks like to look at a graphic and also text. So can you imagine how difficult that would be to try to read text? For instance, that was a small sans serif gray font against a beige background. Do you think that this individual will be able to get access to this? Even blowing it up, it might be very, very difficult. And then Sometimes they use an inversion where it's white text on black background so they can better handle the text. And if you have a layout like that, it might not render well, even with an inversion. And this resource again is available to you, so please, if you'd like to experience yourself what it's like to deal with this, here's a good opportunity. Just follow the directions. It won't be permanent. Glaucoma. Anybody know anybody who's had glaucoma? Yeah, this text is actually black on white. White background, black text. That is one of the most contrasting environments you can have. 
And this is what it looks like to try to see that text. It's very difficult. Diabetic retinopathy. So, I also have diabetes. And in the future, I already have really horrible eyes. Something could happen where my blood vessels start popping. This is what I might have to end up with. And that's how I'm going to have to deal with dealing with the text. Luckily, I'm an assistive technologist, so then I could use other assistive technologies. But the bottom line is, that's how difficult this is to try to deal with that material. Now, there is a blind retinopathy, which is even more exaggerated than that. It's literal black spots, holes in their vision. They can still see, right? Person can still see, but what they're seeing is through these black spots. So it's very difficult to deal with the environment, just vision only. So very often they have to use something else. Cataracts. Anybody know anybody with cataracts or have had cataract surgery? Right. So in dealing with that, did they say, oh my goodness, it was like lifting a veil after the surgery? Now I can see this is what's happening. So if this was gray text, that small gray text, even on the white background, do you think they'd be able to see it? Probably not. So contrast is very, very important for this group. Here's an example of what happens. Now luckily we have true fonts and we have good web text or fonts. We don't have to deal with, with using graphics as text anymore. So hopefully none of us do that. Um, this is what happens potentially if you blow up 36 font. You blow up a graphic that is text. The standard is do not use graphics as text if you can use text. Well, we can use text, so why would we want to do anything different? The only time text in a graphic applies is if it is a marketing object, logo, something of that nature. Then there's another way to deal with that material. Think about that. Now, here's an example. Well, we'll get to this. High contrast, again, is very, very, very important. I'll do it with color blindness because this is a great example of it. So, how many of us, do you know anybody who's colorblind? <coughs> okay. This is huge. It's a perceivable thing again. So notice that the, the other two VI are dealing with, visual impairments, are dealing with perceivable only. Only blindness deals with all four principles. Because cannot see the difference between certain color combinations. That's the issue. How do we manage those color combinations? And actually all of us have an interesting perception in dealing with color. I mean, the example of the dress online was a great example of how many different perceivable options there are for all of us in dealing with color. That was a great example. Now, in dealing with color blindness, of course, it deals with the cones. And there are different types. Here's protonopia. And basically, we're dealing with a red cone deficiency. So. Here is the picture with the red. And this is what it looks like with that, with that deficiency. Now this is in variance, but if you ask an individual to make a decision off of color, how would that happen? They wouldn't be able to, right? Here's green, Deutronopia. Now, what's, what I find interesting is, again, here's the red, but it's the combination of colors, right? It's not just red only. It's, it's almost having the same effect. It's that combination of colors. It's a little more olive. But again, it's difficult by color alone to make a decision. Now here's very, very rare blue color. Now this is really interesting in how much influence blue has on our perception. 
That's incredible. Original? That's a very rare situation, and even rarer is the next. True colorblind, it's well, they're all colorblind. Shades of gray, achromacy. I mean, I can't even, it's like 0. .000 something. Very rare. That's what that group would actually see in dealing with this environment. So, what does that mean? Make sure that colors are not your only method of conveying information. Can we think of something, for instance, that we use in forms for required fields? It usually is identified by a color, but not color alone. Do we know what it is? I know you guys have filled out forms, and I know you've seen this. That's right. It's a red asterisk. So you have an asterisk there, but it's also red. That's an example of not using color alone. You're identifying something with color as well as using an asterisk to identify it. Just like in a sentence, if you wanted to bring out a specific word, you could, and if you used red for instance, as long as you have a good contrast, use red and bold it. You're using two methods of identifying that material. So it doesn't have to be overly difficult. You just need to think about those two methods. Now here's an example of what happens. Oh, I'm at my maximum. Okay. All right. Anybody recognize what this is? Do you know where? Yes, the tube. All right. Here you go. We're only doing color alone. This is an example of what happens if I have to depend on color alone. No, I can't necessarily identify it. So can you think of another way? You have color, but what's another thing that you could do with those different routes as well as color? So you're using two methods of identifying that information. Yeah, dot, dot, dash, dot, 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 dash, dash, dot, whatever. Yes, and in fact, the Atlanta metro system does exactly that. They actually have, in their routes, they have the different line identifiers as well as color. And guess what? Color alone, you could identify it, but it's much easier to identify it by both color and that designation. It's much quicker. It helps everybody. It's not just for this particular group. So if you want to see a real good example, take a trip down to Atlanta and go right on the train down there. It's awesome. Um, that is an example of what you can do, like the asterisk or the bold. So you can really make, in effect, good change, provide good accessibility, and then on top of that, it would be developing a universal door environment. It's actually everybody's going to get benefit from the process. And it doesn't take a lot of steps, necessarily. 